Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Monroe Live podcast. Today, we have a really awesome guest, Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec channels. I say channels because you have a whole suite of channels, even your dad's on YouTube and Twitter. Um, so go ahead and introduce yourself to our viewers, and then we'll get into some hot topics. Yeah, so I'm Kyle. I'm just a car enthusiast in general and really lucky that uh, somehow I found myself into YouTube being work. And we've, yeah, like you mentioned, developed a few different channels across our network. And um, yeah, my dad is killing it. He works harder than anyone. He is just pumping the videos right now. So it's great. Yeah, most of our stuff is electric focused. Um, yeah, trying to get some some data gathering on the cars, not doing anything nearly as crazy as what you guys do here, but range testing, charging testing, practical real world tests. That's where our place is. Yeah. And what I love about the content that you produce is that you have essentially become the expert on charging lately. Like I, I consider you the authority on charging experience and how the vehicles interface with the different charging infrastructure players. So that's been a huge thing that's dominated the news lately, particularly the Tesla charging port. But I find it really interesting when I watch your videos, you know everything about the version of the Tesla charging station that you're at, uh, you know the kilowatt rating, you know the system that backs it up. So if you haven't seen any of his videos, um, I highly recommend checking them out. And also you get access to a lot of press vehicles. So I recently watched your review of the Silverado work truck. And I want you to kind of talk about that 450 mile range. And, and I know you were really high on it. I'd like to get kind of expand on that compared to the cyber truck prediction. Right. Yeah. So, so hard to know exact facts about the cyber truck. Like you mentioned, it's still early days, um, but excited for it. Really excited for this. Uh, I drive an electric truck every day, uh, a Rivian R1T do a lot of towing with it. So yeah, had the great opportunity to go drive the Silverado work truck. I was one of the first of, I don't know, 10 or 20 people that were able to experience it. Did, um, yeah, did towing, did hauling, did, you know, normal cruising around just in this area, actually. I would have brought it by knowing you were so close. And now I know, swing by here. Could have put it up on the rack and pop the battery out of it or something. Um, yeah, no, it, it was fascinating. You know, they put in a, what's weird is GM won't tell you the battery pack size. Yeah. But I hooked up some stuff to it that I wasn't supposed to hook up to it. And it's basically a Hummer EV battery pack, yeah. roughly, as far as I can tell. There might be some differences uh, in terms of like little chemistry changes here or there from what I'm gathering. But generally, it's a 212-ish kilowatt hour usable battery pack, which is juicy. And that is good news for people who tow. I mean, in terms of just like throwing a massive ton of batteries in a vehicle to get from A to B, it's not efficient. It doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, probably if you look at the overall picture, the cost of towing, especially on a trip, it's cheaper to do it with, with your diesel as an example. Yeah. But I mean, it's kind of cool that you can have all these batteries in a truck. I know it's not the most efficient thing. And from someone who tows a lot, you need a lot of batteries to tow. Yeah. And then when you think of a battery that big in a vehicle, the Hummer has not, you know, GM has not been delivering Hummers at the rate that would even satisfy the orders. I know we have a Hummer on order and I haven't heard anything from GM. So what's your thoughts on these big batteries in the truck? So the Cybertruck could be 160 to 200 kilowatt hours. You have these 200, 212 kilowatt hour packs in the GM products. That could be three packs for three or four packs for a smaller vehicle. So with EVs trying to penetrate the market, do you think OEMs are kind of playing these games where they want to sell the bigger vehicles because they're going to make more profit, but they could also make four smaller EVs? So what's your thought on on that? Yeah, well, well, definitely Tesla's mentioned that before. We've heard, you know, lots of topics around, you know, you could build how many Model 3s for one Tesla Semi, as an example. And, you know, the amount of uh, local emissions reduced by those Model 3s could actually have more of an impact than that one Semi, uh, et cetera. There's lots of calculations you can do. You know, a, a, an electric pickup truck with a 200-something kilowatt-hour battery pack is probably the wrong tool for the job for towing over distance, even so, you know, at that point, just try and maybe have a range extended electric vehicle, perhaps like what this Ram situation is yeah. going to be. That could be interesting where you're electric 95% of the time and then have a fairly efficient generator running at 100% throttle, you know, at peak efficiency to charge up the battery. Yes, there's losses. That's appealing to me. Um, you know, I, I think if you look at the overall EV adoption 
you know, sensibly, yes, you should build a small, efficient uh, car at the cheapest cost and the highest volume. But for someone who likes cool stuff and just like the Hummer EV is like the coolest Tonka truck you can buy, it's really dumb. And I've watched all your videos on it and like, I get it. But when you drive it, it's like, I can just drive over the car in front of me and that's really fun. So there, there is a balance of like, let's have a little bit of fun. Let's push the tech. Let's see what's possible with new technology. But in practical large numbers, yeah, you, you can't, this is not the right application for electric. Yeah. What I like about your viewpoint on electric vehicles is that you, you own them, you drive them, you have a lot of them in your fleet. Even your dad, I think, has a Lucid. And then you also own some internal combustion engine vehicles. So a lot of people, it's like religion. It's like EVs and EVs only. But I drive a diesel Yukon. I get crap all the time. Or people don't say anything to my face. But I just drove to North Carolina, and it was 800 miles away. And my vehicle said 750 miles of range as I'm getting 29 miles to the gallon, it was really nice not to have to stop at all, like ever. And so my question for you is, as this transition happens to EVs, do you think the age of cars will grow and grow as you have this either majority at first and then minority that just won't let go? Do you picture a future where you have 20 and 25 and 30 year old vehicles that, that there's a huge repair market just to keep these vehicles going like Cuba for the 1950s, you know, sh you know, shovel Chevrolet Bel Air. So what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely going to be that niche. There's going to be a club where you know, the I'm not switching to EV club and ultimately like the, you know, maybe 10% of hardcore combustion folks out there. Is that going to alter the market that much? No, but there is going to be this, like, I think, enthusiast car owner curve where we're going to see more manual transmission sports cars for weekend track days or canyon blasts that may not, in the, you know, in the long-term future, may not be able to go into inner cities. We're already seeing, you know, emission yeah. zones in certain cities, especially in Europe. But, uh, yeah, I think we're going to see, yeah, definitely a, a combustion resurgence in small groups. You know, yeah, that's a really good point because... I grew up driving a Nissan Maxima. I had a third gen. I loved it. I actually bought like four or five of them. I had a red one, a black one, a white one, all manual transmission. It was like 2,800 pounds with 200 horsepower. And I actually had more fun driving that than our Model 3. Sorry, Tesla. I know the Model 3 is way faster and handles better, really. But there was something about it that I loved. And if I were to buy something to have fun right now, I'd either buy a new Nissan Z because I'm kind of a Nissan guy, or a Supra. And I drove a Plaid for two months, and I took it on a 5,000-mile road trip. And it's fast, and it's it's cool, but it's like, I don't know. There's something about that. And I know this is kind of an EV podcast, and here we are reminiscing about internal combustion engine vehicles. But I think the transition will be longer than than just when we hit 50% EV sales because you have a fleet, a global fleet of what a billion cars or something ridiculous, billions of cars. Yeah. Well, know. globally, of course. Yeah. yeah. And, and other markets will be way behind this transition as well, because there are certain markets that, that, you know, I'm thinking like certain parts of India, South America, uh, especially parts of Africa that just like haven't even thought about electric cars yet. Um, manufacturers are still going to have to service those markets by producing vehicles. Um, you know, it's kind of fun being here in the U S on the bleeding edge of electric adoption. Of course, you, we, we spend a lot of time in Norway and Germany and there it's like combustion is just not even a word used other than the occasional sports car that drives by and they're heavily taxed. And that owner uses it, you know, probably for a small portion of time and has a model X or model S as his daily. And yeah, that's a great use case for a combustion car for the occasional fun times. But I think even more interesting than this is the new car enthusiasm. My world, you know, I come from old school manual transmissions, drifting around, flames out the exhaust. Um, but, but we're starting to see this new enthusiasm around EVs, which I think a lot of car enthusiasts, like a lot of my friends are like, well, who likes electric cars? Who would be into that? And I'm like, well, I don't really care what you're into as long as you're into driving or into your car or transportation. So it's exciting to see all these new technology focused enthusiasts that are coming to the market. Mm -hmm. And for auto racing, and we were at the Formula E race together, and I was a little bit disappointed because it was so quiet. They were actually playing music while the cars were racing because otherwise it would have been just silent as you're waiting for the cars to come around. 
And I know we had brought up the topic of, you know, what will F1 do? And I actually had a journalist reach out to me afterwards and said, hey, Corey, just to let you know, F1 is going to keep uh, internal combustion engine vehicles for a long time. And they've stated that. And I, I didn't, really didn't know that because I don't follow F1 that, that closely. But do you think auto racing will kind of go the way of horse racing where people used to ride around on horses and the Kentucky Derby still exists? And the horses eat hay and they, you know, they still have all the stuff associated, but we look at it almost more as like this pastime. So I hope auto racing retains at least some noise making internal combustion engine. Yeah. I mean, there, there will always be that around for sure. I mean, we look at vintage racing today, you're look, racing cars from the early 1900s up to 1950s. Those cars are still racing around. The cars from today will eventually make their way to vintage racing. And I think it also is cool because it allows for new electric racing series as well. And maybe even an intersection somewhere where you can have electric versus combustion. That would be, at least for today, a really interesting topic for like rally cross. They have these like electric rally things. Uh, It'd be so cool to put them right up against a combustion rally car. See how they do. Yeah, so I want to switch gears and talk about charging a little bit. So Jim Farley's been interviewed several times, and he's talked about how once the charging infrastructure is built out and you have chargers everywhere, the need for these big batteries will decrease. What do you think the average range will be, the average uh, battery size and range will be in 15 years? Do you think it'll steadily increase or do you think it'll it'll decrease or stay the same? Right now, I feel like it's in the high two hundreds. If you were to average them, I don't know. You may have an idea of like where they're at. Do you think it'll it'll go up to three hundred or stay or drop? Uh, so the short answer is, I think it'll drop. Uh, I think the right now the biggest challenge, at least in our market, is charging infrastructure. Yeah. And so, you know, the ability on your normal trip to skip chargers, leaving at a full charge, getting to your destination, charging overnight is a really nice thing. But we also drive really long distances in America. So if you're doing the super long distance road trips, doesn't matter what car you're driving, you have to stop and charge. And that's unfortunately a poor experience unless you drive a Tesla, uh, regardless of any charging network that you're on. It's always a question of, of will it work and how fast will it work? But deep into the future, especially with Tesla now bringing other automakers in. And I'd like to get your opinions on that because some Tesla owners and I own two Teslas are like, well, Hey, we kind of like had the network for this long. Now we're going to be parked next to a bolt charging for two hours. Like what's this going to look like? But on the flip side, I also have CCS vehicles that I'm like, great. I can actually use them uh, properly. So uh, I feel both sides of the equation personally, but um, it deep in the future, let's just say charging does get solved why would you need to carry around a huge 120 kilowatt hour battery pack for if 99% of your driving is just from here to the store and back, put in a low cost, high, you know, uh, resistance to degradation battery pack that's relatively environmentally friendly to make and to recycle, use that for, you know, most of your driving. And then hopefully the technology is there to quickly recharge that on a trip. Yeah. And I feel like most families don't own five of the same vehicles. You may have a truck to do truck things, and then you have a little car to commute to work in. But you wouldn't take your car and do truck stuff, and, and you, but you could put stuff on the roof, and I've seen right, it. You yeah. could jam it filled with boards, and you could commute in the truck and get worse, fuel, you know, worse economy. Whether it's gas or electric, it doesn't matter. Right. So there's a right tool for the job. So if you have four kids and you want to take road trips, Buy the hundred and thirty thousand dollar, hundred and fifty thousand dollar Escalade yeah. EV with yep. four hundred fifty miles of range, where you can put everybody in, and it. that's going to be sweet. We need a full size electric truck. Yeah. I mean, you do. Yeah, <laughs> I could see you getting one of those yeah. Escalade IQs. So I think if you if you want that, you want that nice experience, buy that. And now the fact it can be on the Tesla charging network, that's actually appealing to me to get a Suburban or a Yukon or a Escalade that has a big battery. Prefer most likely built on the same platform as the Silverado that, you know, really no matter what it costs, I almost just kind of want one. Sure. To get the first EV, big EV 
uh, SUV. We need it. Uh, R1S is too small Yep. for, you know, your family size. We have three massive dogs. Like we can't fit into an R1S easily. Um, you know, it's a very American problem is what it sounds like. But, you know, we I grew up with Suburbans. We've always had them. We, we review them all the time. We have them on loan. Just like having an extended wheelbase full-size SUV is once you have it, you can't go back. Yeah. So how do you electrify that? Yeah. And then back to Tesla owners being upset that they're charging – you know, networks are going to be filled. On my phone, I took pictures of every charging station I saw on my road trip to North Carolina. So I stopped along the uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike, which every, almost every single one has charging stations. And there's like 12 or 16. It's amazing. Most times they were completely empty. Of course. I took pictures. There's no one there. So I'm like, you know, the thought of like, oh, they're going to be overrun the only time, I mean, I've charged at a Tesla supercharger station at least a hundred times. You probably charged hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. probably thousands at this point. Th- yeah. So Sandy and I did two big road trips. It was like 48 on one and then like 30 on the other. Only one time did I pull up and all the stars, stalls were filled and I had to wait for like 15 seconds as I'm driving before a, 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 a Tesla drove away and I backed in and it was all full. And then as we were charging, it became 70, 80% full. And that was in Las Vegas by the airport where all the cabbies were charging. Yep. So all the cabs would come and they would charge for 20 or 30 minutes to get a couple hundred miles of range. And then they go do their cab stuff. That was the only time, only one time was it completely full. It's very, if you look at the whole country, it's very uncommon at a Tesla supercharging station to arrive to a full charging station. If you look at segmented areas, South Florida, uh, LA, of course, San Francisco, that's, it's almost the opposite equation. It's almost likely that you'll arrive to a full charging station, but these are very concentrated areas of the country where a lot of Tesla owners live and a lot of other EV owners live who are also going to be trying to use that network. So there's, there's definitely some things Tesla needs to figure out when it comes to, you know, for example, they, they really are the only viable option to a network wide countrywide high power charging solution for every electric vehicle not just their own because we've you know electrify america's proven we can't easily rely on them ev go is in cities but in very small numbers and still quite buggy uh, Alyssa took her e-tron this week to she just needed to te- you know 10 percent more range to make it home it's a very e-tron problem to have but she needed you know just a quick top up and she gets to a charging station it's empty great well two of four were down and the one she used was completely mislabeled based off of the current output of the cable so she was expecting 150 kilowatts she got 80 it really extended the time and so everyone's just going to get frustrated with this and go straight to tesla And so now it's up to Tesla to support all of these cars. And what's interesting is uh, all of the version two superchargers, which there are plenty, won't charge North American charging standard vehicles. They don't speak ISO 15118-2. Really? Yep. So it's only version three superchargers and higher version four, of course. That will work with all the new vehicles? Right, because uh, right now when you plug in a Tesla, they speak over CAN communication, which is what version two knows how to speak. Version 3 superchargers also speak over CAN when they communicate with Teslas. But when you plug in a Silverado with a North American charging standard port, it's not speaking over CAN. It's speaking over the current CCS communication protocol. And so version 2 chargers don't speak that. Do you think there'll be some logic built into the plug that Tesla sells that'll help c- that communication? No, and no. that's that's part of that 12,000 superchargers that every company is announcing. It's just V3s. Okay. Yep. So as far as my understanding goes and everyone in the industry that, that I've spoken to, it's version three and version four chargers that will be open up. Do you think that the version two will all eventually be retrofitted and upgraded over the course of a decade? Yeah, we've seen certain sites that have like, there's one in, I think, Prim Nevada, as an example, where they have a whole bunch of version two chargers with then a whole bunch of version threes behind it. Oh, so you could show up and... If they expand, there could be version twos and version threes where the Teslas could charge at either. Yeah, it, I don't know what Tesla's plan is. We haven't seen them really removing version twos yet. They've just been expanding with new V3s. And so occasionally some stations will be labeled, you know, 150 kilowatt, 250 kilowatt. 
Um, but there's also, um, you know, drivers don't seem to understand that. I was, you know, drivers, this is the big problem is the education portion yeah. of this. Because I was charging in Edwards, Colorado, just a couple days ago. And it's a site that has four Signet EA chargers next to an eight stall V3 supercharger, like right next to each other. And a Tesla owner noses into the Signet EA station, ignores the eight Tesla chargers she just drove by. And it's a rental car because everyone in Denver has a rental Model 3. And like tries to stretch the cable that like she doesn't even have the adapter for. I'm like, lady, you got to go over there. Didn't even know. <laughs> Did not even like, she was just like, what? I got to go to that one? This one won't work? And I'm like, yeah, it oh. says Tesla. You're driving a Tesla. But her car probably directed her there. Well, yeah, because it's right next to the supercharger. Man. So there's a huge human component here that, you know, you just can't fix stupid sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you get access to arguably more press vehicles than, than we do. We, we struggle sometimes because we're an engineering firm too. You're so doing I think a lot that makes them uncomfortable. Yeah, <laughs> uh, putting them on hoist and yeah. poking and prodding. I mean, even we sometimes get a little pushback with like, Oh, you're going to do what with the car? And I'm like, well, here's what we're going to do. We can either use yours or we can borrow a viewers. And we've always gotten cars. We've never had. Oh, an issue that's with smart. That. A little bit of pressure. You hear that, Eric? Yours or a viewers. It's like, do you want one that's like, you know, representative of a production build or, and it's not every time. I mean, we really do know most all of the contacts at the manufacturers. They love what we do because I feel we're pretty unbiased. They know when they fall short and we certainly show that all the time. We're yeah. very fair. Uh, and I think that's just the most important thing from yeah. our side. And what's your thought on the software of all the different OEMs? Because software and how the, the software interfaces with the EV experience, I know, I think you're a little critical on Ford, thinking it, it wasn't really as EV friendly as maybe GM's new uh, software. Or And even theirs is kind of garbage anyway. Oh, really? Yeah. I know it took you forever to find the energy information. Yes. And then the video ended and you finally came back and we're like, oh, I finally found it. And it wasn't of help of the GM employees there either because I was like, guys, do any of you know where to find a trip computer? And we're all poking around and like everyone there had no idea. Oh, they didn't. And I'm just like, well, <laughs> just give me five minutes. And I found it like deep buried in a menu, which is I'm usually good at finding stuff like that. That that's, was annoying. That's crazy that it'd be so buried. You know, it, who... So there's, there's two companies that understand software truly, and it's Tesla and Rivian in my impression. And, you know, Tesla by far is the best integration with the app, uh, you know, with third party APIs allowing me to, you know, log the data from my cars. It's the gold standard. Rivian, I think really saw that copied it, did a pretty good job. Yeah. Sending constant over the air updates, keeping in contact with the uh, owners. It's a touch point for them. And sometimes even if a, a Rivian owner will make a suggestion, they'll even say like, thanks, John, in the release notes, which is really cool. Oh, wow! So I, I love that. Um, you're never going to see that from a Volkswagen or a Porsche or any of those. Yeah. Yeah. There's this guy that I, I talk to quite often in Jacksonville, Florida. He had a big uh, GM truck and it kept going into the shop and it kept breaking down. It had battery issues. It kept He was driving him crazy. And he had a Rivian on order, and he didn't know whether or not to, to take it. And I talked to him probably once or twice a week, and I said, oh, dude, you should just take it. Sandy loves this. He took it, and he absolutely loves it. He talks about it all the time. He's, like, letting his friends and neighbors drive it, and they're all converted. They're, he just can't believe how amazing the software is. That's one of the things he's really impressed with. But he did find a couple things here and there that he – that he wanted to improve, but I think he likes the fact that it keeps improving, just like you mentioned. So yeah, Rivian's really nailed that. I mean, uh, the truck when I I have mine now, I have almost forty thousand miles on it, um, and I you know have a lot of issues with my truck still, like uh, just things that I think they should have engineered better: their four motor system, their battery thermal management system, things like that. Um, and so I'm excited to watch as they expand. But they've been so cool because, um, and, and we've talked about it on, on shows like on our podcast and stuff, but like Rivian reached out to me and was like, hey, um, you use your truck really hard. 25% of my 40,000 miles have been towing. And wow. so like, you know, can we like do a little call and like get your impression and everything? And so, you know, they, you know, I, I gave them specific timestamps as to where I had issues or concerns. They pulled logs from my truck. They showed me charging curves. They showed me temperature data, the battery pack. Um, and then they were like, give us a few weeks and they issued a software update and then it starts to improve and get better. And the reason I love Rivian so much, I mean, what really sold me on it early on was when we had a review truck, we were the, one of the first ones to review the R1T. Um, we did a whole hour long podcast about what we would want to improve on the truck. 
and literally in exact number by number order, Rivian two, you know, three or four weeks later issued a software release fixing like 90% of our issues. And I was like, well, if they value our coverage this much, well, this is amazing. And they, I think, um, you know, they do that with other owners, not just us as well. Yeah. That's really good that some of these new startups, uh, whether that's Rivian or Tesla, I think they're open to criticism because they don't have a hundred years of like pound the table. This is how we've always done internal combustion engine vehicles, or this is how we've built bodies. If you think of Tesla doing the giga castings or the structural battery pack, these like wild things that we've never seen ever before because EVs are so new. I think there'll be a convergence maybe 20, 30 years from now where all these different ways that people are doing thermal systems, all these different uh, levels of, of, of charging units or charge modules, you'll find the sweet spot because you could always go overkill. So like the Lucid does a lot of things really, really, really good, but is it overkill? you know, with their, uh, the high voltage of their system, it kind of almost overshot the infrastructure. And, and there is like a sweet spot that I think will be found. And I explained this to someone, it's like brake systems. So I've done probably a hundred brake jobs because my dad was a mechanic and I had all the tools. So not only on all my own vehicles, but all my friends' vehicles and in college, all my friends' BMWs, there's never been a brake job that I couldn't figure out just by looking at it. It's either a fixed caliper or a sliding caliper. You reach around the back. If it's a BMW, it's an Allen wrench. If it's a GM or Ford product, it's a big hex bolt. It's usually like a size, you know, M16. Like, it's so easy. They all converge to what worked best. But you go back to the 70s or 80s, you had drum brakes and all these horrible systems. And I think you'll see a convergence. So Toyota, BMW, Mercedes, all of them are very similar braking systems because it's really what worked best. And I think you'll see this with EV, EV technology, particularly thermal systems, battery systems, charging systems, and then software interface. I think, but we're, we're like decades away from that that process. Well, you're totally right. Cause in what world, let's just use this. We've been talking about the Silverado work truck for a little bit. Let's use that as an example. In what world would a combustion truck launch with an engine that's twice as powerful as the next closest competitor where this work yeah. truck launches with twice the battery pack of the next. I mean, this is a huge jump that just doesn't happen in the internal combustion world anymore. Cause everyone's just incrementally improving yeah. their stuff. You know, you go 6.2 liter now 6.8 liter and Oh, I got 400, 420 horsepower. And uh, you know, that that's the crazy world we're living in with EVs. You can have a lucid air as an example that, has all the range in the world. I mean, we've tested, you know, close to 450 miles at 70 miles an hour. Very impressive. But then is completely let down by the charging infrastructure, which means it's actually not as good of a road tripper as a Model S, which has much less range, but a better charging yeah. profile and better infrastructure. Yeah. A bigger battery means more charge time. People yes. forget about that. The, yeah, it may charge faster in the middle because... You know, but Lucid doesn't. They doesn't. really need to work on their charging oh, curve. Yeah, you would know. Yeah, but and that's where Porsche gets it. So right with the Taycan, um, where it's a small battery pack. It's like only eighty-five kilowatt hour usable, but it holds two hundred seventy kilowatts all the way to fifty percent. So you're able to onboard so much energy. You know, it's zero to fifty percent in ten minutes. Zero to seventy percent in fourteen oh, wow. minutes. And so that's why the the Taycan is the ultimate road tripper, assuming you have charging infrastructure that yeah. can power it. Yeah. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's a wild time with EVs for sure. Yeah. So Cybertruck. Yeah. Now this may get a little bit. So what do you, what is your prediction on the different battery sizes for the Cybertruck? Do you think there'll be a smaller battery and then a bigger battery? Cause I know they talked about 500 miles of range at one point. I heard someone estimated 331 miles of range with 167 kilowatt hour battery pack. So do you think it'll be closer to that 2.2 miles per kilowatt hour or two miles per kilowatt hour? What do you think the efficiency will be? And what's your thought on where that'll enter the market? Dude, I have no idea. I re it could be, uh, this thing could be so out of left field that it could be, you know, closer to almost 2.8 miles per kilowatt hour if they play their cards right. Or Tesla could just say, we're throwing batteries at it, screw it. And it's going to be inefficient. I don't think that's the Tesla way. So, um, I will say in mixed driving, my R1T, which I think is a comparable size to the Cybertruck overall and weight and things like this, gets roughly two miles per kilowatt hour. Um, 
I think the Cybertruck has to beat it. That's yeah. the thing. I mean, they, the, Tesla was the first to announce the last to come to market. They know what e they know everyone's cards at this point. No matter what the Cybertruck is, they're going to sell every single one that can make at least for the next few years because there's a lot of in Tesla enthusiasts who have never owned a truck buying it as a cool device to play around with, but they still need to compete on some sort of truck level because Tesla's always been the best. They need to continue being the best. Yeah. So it needs to be the most efficient, needs to be the fastest, needs to be the most capable, needs to have off-road cred. We know it's going to have rear steer, um, really cool stuff going on with it. But I think it's just too early to know because with Tesla, I don't even think Tesla knows half the things, you know, a lot of people within the company, I should say, I think they're keeping it fairly tight. A lot of the specs. Yeah. And the advantage Tesla has is I think it'll be lighter than a Rivian because it'll have aluminum in the front, aluminum in the rear. Um, what they've released so far, you can deduct what the structure will be like underneath. It'll have pretty basic steel cradles. I think there's a picture someone took rear cradle will be steel, the front cradle will be steel, mm -hmm. which is good, which they're prioritizing cost. It's like a cost balance with uh, functionality. Like a lot of Toyotas and Kia products, they have steel subframes, even BMW. So with Rivian, you get a body on a frame and aluminum cradles yes. and quad motor and ridiculous travel and this special like so yeah, it's everything to yeah, the max yeah sandy and i had a conversation today and i think tesla will not go after all of the things the rivian does particularly the suspension travel i agree and the that kind of patagonia style off-road feature set with like the pass-through tunnel and all this cool features i think they're going to be more spartan meaning it, it'll just be you know, that stainless steel, that kind of minimalistic Model 3-esque feel where it'll do the things that Tesla does well. So software, range, and charging. I think you're, I don't know about 2.8 miles per kilowatt hour. Yeah, no, I don't think if, so. if they can get to 2.5 or 2.4 yeah. with a battery that's twice as big as a Model Y, now there's only about 1,600 or 1,700 cells in the pack. And you, if you can get 2.4 times that usable, I don't know, with regen, you'd be at 360 to 380 miles of range and then have a, some slightly bigger version where you get a bigger pack. Yeah, the only reason to have a bigger battery pack than that would just be for towing, towing. in my impression, yeah. because I just did a range test yesterday, which sucked, in a Mercedes EQS SUV, and it went 375 miles on a charge at 70 miles an hour constant, which is huge for only 108 kilowatt hour usable battery pack. Wow. Um, so like crazy efficient for a, you know, you know, three row, seven seater SUV, but that took six hours and it was terrible. <laughs> like really? You don't need to drive that far. The only reason you need more range is for towing, which I think a lot of Cybertruck owners are going to tow because I think a lot of people have that F-150 or Tacoma or some other truck, and they're waiting for the Cybertruck to replace some of that capability. I agree with the not going as heavy in the off-road department yeah. because we live in Colorado on the off-road trails, and even uh, like we're like mecca of off-road, and maybe 10% of trucks ever see a trail. Yeah, yeah. Um, one other thing with, oh, man, I just had a thought queued up, and now I forgot. Well, I, while you're thinking, okay, I have a ahead. question for you. What, when it comes, because you guys, uh, really fascinating walking through here, by the way, and seeing the shop and everything. Um, I certainly am nowhere near an expert when it comes to manufacturing a vehicle or engineering a vehicle from the ground up. But if you had to pick a company, you know, particularly among the startups of Lucid, Rivian, um, uh, Tesla, of course, who do you think has the engineering uh, ability to basically vertically scale their whole operation. We've seen Tesla do it from a manufacturing process. All the stuff you guys talk about blows my mind as to what they're capable of doing. It seems to me like they're just so far ahead of everyone else, but I don't know if that's just me only seeing certain videos or if the others are also pretty competent and skilled in these areas, or is Tesla truly that far ahead? I think Tesla's truly that far ahead, but it's for reasons that are beyond just the engineering capability. It starts with leadership and it may seem cliche like, oh, leadership. You truly have to have your organization bought into a mission. And if you look at what Elon stated, the mission for Tesla, it's to transform the world to sustainable energy. And he does things that are actually contrary 
to profitability. Like when they're starting to drop prices to get sales up, it actually is because they don't have any, any bona fide marketing, getting the cars out there and sold at a half a million per quarter that is the most valuable thing because everyone I know that owns a Tesla, they let all of their, they drive all their friends around in it. My mother-in-law bought a Model Y. All of her relatives have been driving it. You know how many of her relatives bought Model Ys? I think two. Oh, nice. Both yeah. of her sisters. Sure. They just ordered them and got them and they love them. They, I've you know, seen it too. My whole family, you know, we're, they're all Tesla people. To me, uh, Elon and Tesla's emulating what Apple did. So nobody knew they wanted an iPhone when they when Steve Jobs really you know launched one that it would actually take over how the world operates think about the trillions of dollars of of ecosystem and and economy that's built off of the app industry Uber Lyft Uber Eats all of these apps and all of the money that flows through what and I, I see you have an iPhone 14 Pro probably I have an iPhone 14 Pro Every one of our videos is filmed on these devices. Oh, so, same here. This yeah. films every out of spec video right here. Yeah. yeah. And when we go visit places, they're like, well, well here's all your all your stuff. <laughs> sure. And I have one, two, three, there's five iPhones sitting here. And I feel like Tesla, they've kept their styling very similar, but it's just something people want to have, even if hundreds of thousands and soon millions of people have model threes and model Ys and soon to be that low cost Bev and the cyber truck is conquering a different part of the segment. They're not, they're not converting Silverado owners to cyber trucks sure. or uh, uh, F-150 owners to cyber trucks. They're converting people who have model threes, model Ys, mach -E's. So, so many people I talk to when I go to these shows, they're like, Oh, I drive a, a whatever, a, a mach -E, but I'm just waiting for my Cybertruck. I hear it all the time. It's like the most common thing yes. I hear. And I'm not talking 10 people. I'm talking hundreds, probably close to a thousand times I've heard that. Oh, you know, it's coming. But they're waiting patiently, like religion, like the, yeah. the second coming of Christ right. is, yeah. is, is the true. birth of the Cybertruck. And it's good and bad. A lot of it's bad just because of commenters always just like, oh, Cybertruck's, you know, the one to get. But it's like, you can't get it now. So what are you going to get today? Yeah. is what we deal with a lot. But yeah, dude, it's pretty wild how there is... Uh, so, so you think it's less to do with the manufacturing capabilities and more to do with this aura around Tesla and this integration yeah. and how nicely everything works. But then they back it up. And not only do they back it up with the products they deliver, their ability and rate of change is much faster than we've ever seen in the automotive industry. So out in our shop, we have a Model 3 that we took delivery of in January of 2018. We have a Model Y that was one of the first Model Ys, VIN number 3000, uh, with the Giga castings in the rear, but it was the split one. It wasn't even the single right. one. Yep. And then they sent a year later, they made a change where it was one big casting. And now we have a Texas Model Y with casting in the front and the rear. Now the Cybertruck is a huge casting in the front, two big castings in the rear, and this, you know, exoskeleton design, even though Sandy and I think it's a traditional body side outer and giga sure. casting. So, um, and then the structural battery pack, you know, has not been in that many Model Ys you know, roughly 10,000 because they, they said, oh, we've made 10,000 cells. Well, if you do the math, they made 10 million cells. If you do right. the math, that's only like 10, 15, it was, it was 12 something when I calculated it out. Yeah. Yeah. Not that many. No. So I think they're piloting the 4680 in the model Y is really to prepare for the cyber truck, which will be 4680 only in my opinion. Right. Well, what was a little bit disappointing with 4680 was during the battery day presentation and everything. I mean, it was touted to be the best, you know, top line thing. And then they put it in the base model Y and it, like, even then it charges very poorly and like, didn't have like, there was nothing material that I could go to someone and say, here's why this is the clear choice over a 2170 long range. And it was just not the clear choice yeah. other than watching your videos and seeing that whole thing come out as yeah. one piece, which was so cool. I mean, so I have some friends who are very connected with the, you know, German legacy car building way, if you will. And they're uh, a great uh, Swiss company. Their futurist is called future matters. And the, these guys are really good friends of mine. And, you know, we were talking about this and they're just like, everyone is freaking out over here, over this, over your videos on this, uh, the yeah. way this Model Y was constructed. They're like, Volkswagen's losing their mind. Daimler's losing their mind. It's crazy. So you're telling me all those people saw me in those videos? Yeah, you are famous. Yeah, because 
Sandy was traveling. He was still in, we were in Italy. We visited Idra. Yeah. And our vehicle showed up and we knew it was such hot news that the, the vehicle rolled in this facility. And I said, get it apart. And they literally were ripping it apart. I showed, I came back early from Italy and I walked in and it was ready to drop. And we were like, well, should we wait for Sandy? It's like, screw it. Yeah, yeah get this that is, thing this on is YouTube. such big news. So we did like seven videos until Sandy came back and he was in video seven. I think we got like four or five million views on those like it was epic. 15 videos. Yeah. It, it really shocked not just the Tesla enthusiasts, which I think, you know, a lot of them, every one of them watches your videos, but we have some, not very many, but we have a pulse on what's going on in the car industry, not only from a PR communications marketing yeah. side, but also from, uh, you know, an engineering yeah. side, just friends that I've made along the way and everyone's losing their mind. I mean, it was, and, and, you know, you can always tell like, who's a really cool engineer when they're like, that's awesome. It was it, crazy. It was crazy. I still technically owe Sandy a steak dinner because when we first saw the image they released from Giga Berlin, actually, they showed the seats mounted to the pack. Mm -hmm. And I go, ah, oh, Sandy, no way. Because <laughs> here I'm thinking of all of the challenges you have to overcome with wiring, with plumbing of HVAC, with the assembly of the the center console, the carpet would have to fold up. And I'm like, well, oh, I, I don't know. And he's like, no, no, they're going to do it. And of course they are. And then another thing that Sandy predicted was hairpin stator on the fourth gen drive unit for the Model Y, the Model 3, and presumably all future Teslas. And he's like, oh, no, no, I swear. And I said, oh, I don't know. And of course, yes, he's go. right there. So don't doubt Sandy. That's Have you what pulled I'm apart like. one of these brand new drive units that no. are coming out? The hardware four? Yeah. No, no. That I'm really curious to see what the heck is going on in there. We could get one, but the, it's one of those things we have to find a vehicle. It's easy to find out. You climb underneath to see if the oil filter's gone, and it's right. like the integrated part of the case. I did see all of the Model Ys being built in Berlin had the new drive unit okay. being installed, and I that was the one thing I was able to see with my eyes that was actually kind of juicy. And um, the, I think the Texas ones are being built with it, but they're like very slowly rolling it out. Now, what that means is we've heard from people that – it's a better unit. It's more efficient. It's more powerful. So if they're releasing vehicles with this more powerful, more efficient unit, yet the range remains the same, yet the power remains the same, at what point do they unlock that potential or are they software locking the vehicle so that you don't have, I forget what the effect is where people don't buy the old thing. Cause right. I know what you're talking about. There's some name for it. Yeah. But but um, on that topic of rating range, Tesla rates range in I would say an unrealistic way. Because if you dr you've driven the Model Three, you've driven the Plaid around. If it says three hundred miles, you got to drive around town to get three hundred miles. You're not getting that on the yeah. highway. Whereas yesterday I did again that EQS SUV. Taycan's the same way. BMW iX is this way as well. The Germans really tend to very. Or, or perform very poorly in the EPA number because there's multiple cycles you can choose from. Yeah. But And then in the real world, it's an over-deliver. You sort of, no matter how you drive Taycan, you will get 50 to 80 miles more than EPA, sometimes 100 more. And in EQS SUV, I got 75 more just sitting at 70 miles an hour on the highway cruising. So do you think that they're, like Tesla rates range fairly? Because they're obviously just going to, to maximize the system. Mm, rates range fairly. I have found that when I drive other vehicles, because I, because I've driven Tesla so much, I've come to expect underperforming the mileage. So it says sure. three hundred. I'm like, eh, I'm probably going to get two sixty. Yeah, I've come to expect that. And then I get in. Uh, I got a Lexus RZ four fifty. Oof! Sorry to hear that. Yeah, I got one. And I, I what do you think of that? Yeah. Uh, so. I always like Japanese vehicles, so I got. I thought the door was really tall, and I, I haven't driven one yet, so I don't know. Oh, yeah. finally! I've only driven a BZ4X and a Solterra. Oh, it, it was it was okay. Yeah, uh, Toyota and Lexus do this thing with their screens, where some of them have like that haze, <clears throat> that kind of hazy look. Oh, it's almost like a screen uh, protector that you want to pull yeah. off. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. Yes. They had that on one of the screens. I didn't like that. Okay, um, it was decent. Um, I really like the center console, believe it or not, because it flipped uh, up like this. You mean sideways? Yeah, no, no. So the German ones will split. Yes. So that you don't have to fight with your you yes. know, wife or girlfriend or whatever. You can open just half. This one hinged like 
that way. Okay. But it also hinged the other way. Oh, was so it, you could choose. It was a double hinge. It was crazy. What happens if you unlock both hinges at the same time? So I thought they could actually do a hinge this way, hinge that way, and then have it flip up in the back. But they didn't. Oh, okay. So I don't know. I didn't try. <laughs> that would have been really fun. Just pops off. So I like that. But I thought it was... So Corey's review of the Lexus RZ is all about the center console. I did a whole video. <laughs> Eric, didn't really? I? I, I did amazing. a whole video. I did a whole review. It got like 20,000 views. Sure, that, that sure. Are, it doesn't do very well. But yeah. the one thing, when I got in, it had like 125 miles of range. And in my mind, I took a BMW, uh, the 5 Series electric one home. And a lot of times I'll get in them and they'll have 120 miles of range because people drive around here yeah that thing like drained so fastly the bmw like by the time i got home went to my in-laws it was at like 40 miles was, i'm like what the hell it was an i4 m50 yeah that yeah, one the yeah, blue yeah. one it's really nice yeah but it just wasn't efficient or no, something the, that one it, it had particular. the pilot super sport tires and right the, yeah whatever but this this lexus i do the same thing i took it home i took it to my mother-in-law's because she has a tesla she, she loves seeing them so yeah then i drove home and i park and it said like 122 and then i like drove somewhere else uh, to the store drove home drove to work and i got back to work the next day and it said like 112 so like really efficiently it like overperformed so to your point it it didn't drain really quickly it was like real world they they wanted to make sure i wasn't scared it like instilled confidence that i can mm. drive around a lot and what may have happened in that case is you know maybe the the press car guys ripped it on yep. the highway and it started to adjust yeah so th so then that comes into the conversation of guesso meter versus rated range calculation which is a topic for a different podcast yeah but yeah d did you play around with that sunroof thing no oh it has this uh, like electrochromatic uh, sunroof oh. which is really cool eric I, I only you know, know it because I saw um, uh, our friends at Mach-E Vlog had, uh, had one on test, and they were playing around with that. There is one in the Denver press fleet we can grab. I just thought no one would be interested, so we haven't made a video on it yet. I don't think people were that interested. Okay. Eric, how'd yeah. it do? No? Come on, producer. It's got 40,000 people. Oh, 40. Look at that. Okay. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. That's not good for us. Yeah. Our average is like 100. Yeah, you guys are doing great. I would say probably won't see an out-of-spec review on it anytime soon, unless maybe when I'm out of town, the guys can play around with it and make some videos. Yeah, I saw one at the Chicago Auto Show, and we did like a little bit of a walk around, and it was silver, but the one we got in the press press fleet was blue, and was kind of funny. Mm. It actually was like VIN number like 120. Oh, and, really? And on the visor, it actually said pre-production prototype. Sure, so Toyota will do that. They They'll say send, that. Yeah. It's they're still series production. Yeah, but they they don't actually sell them after they do crush those. Oh really? Yep. So if it says pre production, they can't. They're non saleable. Yeah, that's what it was. Which which is the first one we've got. Normally they don't say that when we get it from press fleet. Yeah. Have you guys done any other cars recently? Mm. Reviews wise, you we had got, we got a GMP. Pr we got a Prius. Well, what do you think of that? Well, I, I didn't do any reviews on it. Okay. Sandy and I travels. You travel a lot. Yeah. Sandy and I aren't here. Like we were in Portland. Yep. We were in Vancouver. We visited Recyclico, the recycling plant. Right, really saw that. Cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was actually really cool. Full videos coming soon. Good. And tomorrow I'm headed to Proterra in yep. South Carolina. See what they got going on. They make bat they make buses and batteries. They have a cool test track there. Oh. You have been there? You can drift a bus. Have you been there? No, but I've heard about it. Oh man, look at that. We looked at the Ionic Six recently. Oh yeah. The Ionic Six, yeah, kind of looks. It's like just a uglier than the Ionic Five. I like the rear of it. Believe oh, it. Oh, that's not. the worst part. How? Because <laughs> it kind of looks like a Porsche from the from the eighties. It's like okay, maybe someone described a Porsche <laughs> over the phone, and like you know, they just were had a warped perception. But I d I've, yeah, sure. I mean, it's a great car technically. Yeah. I think you know, charging from a EV user standpoint, the Hyundai Kia Genesis stuff is. Very fast charging, um, and that's that's the key metric of that car. Great driver assistance, very quiet, rides really nice, all that stuff. Have you had one? Yeah. Yeah. thought it was okay. Yeah. We, had a, we had a white one. Yeah, I, I just went on the first drive for it in Phoenix, so I haven't done any testing on it. But okay. uh, I've driven Ionic 5 a bunch as well. So, And you said earlier, uh, before we got on the podcast, you're headed to China. So what are you, you going to do in China? We're going to drive a bunch of stuff. So... 
yeah, we've been waiting on visas and stuff. This is just like taking way too long. I was supposed to be there already. Friends of ours already are in China basically waiting for us to get there. Um, oh, but, uh, yeah, it's just like, a you know, long, long process, crazy process, but, uh, yeah. So, so going to be in Germany for a couple weeks around, uh, end of August, early September. And then we're thinking straight from there, popping over to China. I want to do the world's longest road trip using Neo battery swap. I think oh. that would be a really fun yeah. video. Go see the great wall, go up to Beijing, like do a huge road trip around China, look at charging infrastructure along the way, stop at a bunch of factories, bunch of automakers. Shanghai is of course, like the Detroit of China. So want to go drive a bunch of weird cars that they have over there and stuff we've never heard of. But my friend Drew, who owns Martian wheels is there now. And Drew was just saying like, he's been counting the number of electric cars since the last time he was there. And it's like, he's like, it's, 10 times as many really just huge explosion. He's like stuff I've never heard of. And he's like, you don't see EQEs or EQSs or I sevens. You see Tesla and you see like stuff that just like never, he never knew what that was. Yeah. I've seen someone did a chart of all these EV startups in China. I think there was like 600 at one point, but there was like the top, they did a chart of the top, I don't know, 50 or 70 or something. And a lot of them had X's through that had gone out of business or merged or whatever. So even they're having a paring down moment as well. And I think the U S doesn't, hasn't really gotten there yet. We have Lordstown, you know, yeah, that filed was rough. For bankruptcy. We have a, you know, there's Nikola had their problems with Trevor Milton. And yep. I think uh, lucid their sales, I think Dude, are, they, no one wants one of those things is what we're finding. They're expensive. They're expensive. They're great. I mean, I just did, uh, you know, 12,000 miles in our Lucid and my dad just took it back. And, um, you know, the car itself is, is from a driving perspective, the almost the best. I mean, the compromise of having a non-air suspension, ripping up a Canyon from a performance standpoint, but then also, you know, in terms of its compliance on road and just its manners are really next level good. And of course, the range and the efficiency for a car that big is next level good. Um, but like it's $155,000 for a grand touring with, you know, Dream Drive and all this stuff. But they charge $10,000 for it to do lane centering. What? Yeah. And it doesn't even do auto lane changes. Oh. I mean, they claim software updates will come, but, you know, we've, we've had our car uh, for a few months and they've been out for over a year. And it just, you know, just got auto screen brightness when it gets dark outside. Oh my God. So there's still a lot of work to do on that thing. And um, I think we're almost at an hour. Um, one big question that I have for you is at Tesla's recent uh, shareholder meeting or investor day, I forget what it was. Elon kind of mentioned, uh, he may have mentioned on Twitter that they're thinking about licensing their autopilot software. Who do you think that OEM is? I saw a poll online and it was overwhelmingly one, but who do you think it is? Right. Everyone thinks it's Ford. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. I could totally see it being Ford. Uh, I know Sammy, the guy at Ford who, who runs their ADAS program. Uh, he's a cool, cool guy and um, came from Argo AI, I believe. And he's based in Pittsburgh and talked to him a lot about these Blue Cruise things. It's just like um, that makes it more real, the FSD situation, at least the autopilot sack. Because in terms of the car's competence on the road, no one can match what Tesla can do. Um, but there are a lot of systems that can just stick in the middle of the lane and do adaptive cruise without yeah. phantom braking and all these things. It's almost like Tesla's doing too much where the cars are getting confused and it annoys me driving around. I have FSD on my Model S and never use it personally. Um, but there is definitely no question that they are farther ahead than anyone. Yeah. But that also puts them into a little bit of a sketchy category. So, yeah, I don't know which automaker would do it. I didn't think any of them would. But they said major automakers. So that's not a Rivian. That's not a Lucid. That's not a new startup. That's a Ford GM situation. Yeah. And it could be a big win for Mary Barra if GM surprises everybody and and they are the first. Because I think Ford kind of one-upped them with the with the NACS plug. Yep. And I felt like GM was a fast follower. I said, this is an opportunity for Mary to actually maybe – 
I don't want to make any predictions because I just genuinely don't know. But uh, would I could see it going any direction, and it would be fascinating to understand the conversations that are going on. So do you think the dominoes will fall as quickly as they did with the charge port? Because with NACS now, I don't care who announces now that they're switching to Tesla's network. It's old news, whatever. Everyone's going to switch. Yeah, everyone's switching. Yeah. So it's like you don't want to be the 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th. You want right. to be 1, 2, and 3. So do you think if let's say Ford or GM announces they're switching. And now your Ford, your Mercedes, your Mercedes, this is different because they're working on their system with like mobile eye and you have all the, the hardware yeah. maybe won't work as well. This is, this is totally different because if you look at a traditional OE mindset, it is we produce the vehicle, the customer fuels the vehicle. So they don't want to be in the fueling business. Yeah. And that's why I think it was such an easy decision to say, yeah, throw a NAX port on our cars be, and get access to the supercharger network. We don't want to deal with it. We've never dealt with it. Yeah. With driver assistance, those are all separate competing systems being built in-house. And I agree back to your point on consolidation. It's going to happen. This is the beginnings of it. Don't know who it's going to be, but it is going to be, you know, some automaker is going to have to walk away from a lot of money invested, a lot of time invested, a lot of convincing, a lot of, you know, their own internal safety or, you know, standards that they want to include in the system. And maybe it'll be like a nerfed version of autopilot. Yeah. 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 That, that's, I think will be, that I think will be bigger than the charge port. Totally. Just the charge ports, it's a non, it's big more, deal. Yeah. The port is, is not a big deal, but the access to the network is the big deal. And that's I tried to explain that deal. to someone like, well, what's the difference in cost and what's this? And I said, ah, that's all relatively menial. It's the user experience of a GM, a Ford, a Rivian owner that now they can buy the vehicle and take a road trip. Totally. So that, so that may actually hurt, uh, the Tesla sales a little bit because now you've actually their biggest advantage. You've now opened it up. Yeah. You know, so that walled garden that, that Elon uses that he's like, I didn't want a walled garden. And well, there's the proof. Yep. And that it really takes a lot of humility for him to offer that olive branch to the other OEMs. Like, Hey, use my kick-ass network. Totally. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I'm pretty involved in the charging side, like you were saying, and I was at this event called Charin, uh, you know, and they do these testing yeah. situations. And, you know, we kind of saw the the Ford charging people and the Tesla charging people kind of buddy-buddy, and Tesla had a pretty big presence at this for the first time. I mean, they've been to other events, but there was, like, a lot of people from the Tesla charging team. Ah, so you had a little inclination? I was just like, what's going on here? I didn't think it was because Ford was going to switch to Tesla. I thought, actually, it was because Tesla was... At the time, I was thinking, well, Tesla's putting Magic Dock on their stations. Uh, they want to make sure they're interoperable with all of the cars that are on the road. Do you think that was, when was that timing-wise? A month yeah. before? This was right after Magic Dock launched. Oh, so that would have so, been a couple months before. Yeah, actually, maybe closer. Yeah, maybe one one month, somewhere around there to the announcement, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It was fascinating. So now I don't think Magic Dock's going to be a thing. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, one last question, and we'll... We'll keep it more personal. Um, what's your favorite thing to do not related to automobiles or electric vehicles? I don't know if there is one. <laughs> <laughs> this is like when I asked Sandy, what do you do for fun? And yeah. Eric and I were on a road trip, and his answer was one word, emails. Right. And he was actually serious. Sure. That, you know, so. Yeah, I, 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 the, uh, to be totally transparent, there is nothing I do outside of this. So, you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of an answer that uh, Mr. Beast gave on an interview. He's being interviewed, I think, by Joe Rogan. Okay. And he he talked about how him and three other people, for like three straight years, all they did was do these Slack calls or Zoom meetings and talk about thumbnails and the length of videos and the brightness of the thumbnails. And they were, yep. they were just studied it. And he essentially implied that, that that's what he loved and that's all he did. So it's kind of good that you're passionate about. Yeah. I love this. the business of, of automotive media. I love cars, love driving stuff. And so like anything around adventure, off-roading, track driving, towing, hauling. I mean, that's what we do for fun. Like our fun day out is we're either hitting the trails or we're hitting the track. Yeah. It's a pretty cool job you have. 
What's your fun thing to do other than go to North Carolina, hang out at the Outer Banks, which oh. is great. Did you go to Duck? I stayed in Duck. Duck is the best place. Yeah. Technically, I stayed on the border of Duck okay. and Corolla. Yeah. So, yeah, I was right there in Did Duck. Did you get to drive on the dunes at all? No, no. Oh, bummer. I, I think I could have. I had an all-wheel drive Yukon. I could have deflated the tires or whatever. Yeah, on the southern tip when you go down, you can you know, just cruise up and down. It's amazing. No, no. Yeah, I stayed right there. Yeah, so what do I do for fun? I like to run, actually. I knew this, yeah. Yeah, I, I think since I, since we were, you were in Tesla Takeover last year. Since that point, I think I ran 2,200 miles, and I've lost like 50 pounds. Since yeah, I was going to say, and and huge congratulations yeah. to that. You look amazing. You oh, really thanks. have gotten, you know, not that you were totally out of shape, but you look great. Yeah. Uh, it's giving me inspiration to do something similar. And um, also as a thank you to you, I mean, you're one of the, I would say, most well-educated, well-rounded people in the EV community. Oh, appreciate because, that. Because, uh, yeah, when everyone asks, like, who, who you know, they, they come to me, they're like, who's the real expert? I'm like, Corey. Corey is the guy. No. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, you really are the guy. And so I uh, love your videos when you're in them. Love the stuff you're doing. I mean, everything here at this business, I mean, I know how much of an impact you've had over the years. It's pretty crazy. Um, and so, yeah, you deserve every bit of success that you have. I appreciate it. Sure. All right. I think we'll wrap it up with that. Um, it's been about an hour. And uh, I'm going to go give you a tour of the rest of the facility after this. Great. And I got a six-hour drive. Ooh, going to <laughs> Indianapolis. That's right. Oh, man. Real fun. Eric, you want to take us out here? No? No. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. You can do it. All right. So thanks for watching Monroe Live Podcast. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you subscribe. And you can find our podcast everywhere where you find your podcasts like Apple Music or Spotify. Thank you very much.